Hello and welcome to Critical. I'm Sylvia. And I'm Robin. We're a mother-daughter team here to watch bad horror movies for you. We've got a pretty long list of movies that no one wants to cover on their respective platforms. So here we are. We're looking for that diamond in the rough to save you time and scrolling through all the movies that you just can't seem to start watching because you're not sure they're worth it. How much time would you say you've spent scrolling through movie lists on various platforms? I think, depending on which platform, definitely Hulu and stuff, going through all the D-listers, maybe starting a few, can't even make it 10 minutes through. But how, how much time altogether in your life have you spent scrolling? Hours. Hours. Sometimes, Hours. sometimes you scroll the length of a movie and then watch a movie. <laughs> right. So I think this is a big time saver. Yeah. Um, and here, I mean, you know, not to get to the end before we've begun, but I think that you'll especially appreciate that here. So this episode is all about a pretty bad Rotten Tomato flop called Transylvania 6 5000. Transylvania 6 5000. It was released by New World Pictures in 1985 and clocking in at 93 minutes, although it felt a lot, lot longer. No kidding. It stars one of our favorites, Jeff Goldblum, which, if we're to be honest, that's why we chose this as the first movie to cover. Yep. Ed Begley Jr., Joseph Bologna, Carol Kane, Jeffrey Jones, John Biner, Gina Davis, Michael Richards, Donald Gibb, Norman Fell, and Teresa Gansel. Quite an ensemble cast, and in fact, a bit of trivia, over half of the main cast is over six feet tall. Really? Watching this, <laughs> yes. whoa, yeah. I, I mean, you know that that's something going for it. But at the same time, I found myself asking, how many famous comedians does it take to make a not funny movie? Uh, I'd say a lot of the movies on this list are from the eighties. Uh, my personal favorite era for pop culture. Uh, but you weren't alive then. Ah. I think I've seen a bit more 80s movies than you have, <laughs> and a lot of them are on our mm -hmm. list, actually. Mm -hmm. I can I can say that. She thinks she's seen more 80, 80s movies than me. That's fine. That's fine. So I can uh, tell if this movie was purposely making fun of the classic monsters, but it really did seem like it was for the vampire and werewolf parts, and I'm going to be honest, uh, I'm pretty serious about my vampires and werewolves. Best thing. Ah. Uh, Spoilers for the ending, but the werewolf is just a guy with hypertrichosis, so it's like the abnormal hair growth genetic mm -hmm. disease, right? Yeah. And the vampire is just a girl who uh, wants attention, right? Yeah, and a quick segue, I will say that there was just, a, and this is not in the realm of this particular movie, but did you know that we still possess all of the genes that we would need to grow hair all over our bodies? They've just been turned off. So is hypertrichosis Hypertrichosis who have it turned on. Correct. Nice. Yeah, um, so there's, you know, in terms of like the pattern of girls uh, dressing uh, scantily to get attention um, and being sort of hypersexualized, there's a, definitely a pattern with similar things like that in lots of other 80s horror movies. Um, if we take a moment to probe a little bit deeper to try to find some sort of meaning uh, and bigger takeaway from this movie... What is it that the townspeople are afraid of? What do the monstrosities represent to them? For Frankenstein and the wolf man or the wolf boy, it is their perceived capacity for violence. Whereas for the vampiress, it is her sexuality. Among the spoofing, we're also getting a satirical morality play which reflects those in the original monster movies. Yeah, that sounded pretty scholarly. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a reflection on that that goes back to even the original Frankenstein, I'd say. Uh, this movie doesn't have an actual guy made of different corpse bits, and it's apparent that the OG movies exist in this universe. So why are they actually scared when these actual, air quotes, monsters come in? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, maybe if we're going to try to find a bigger meaning, it would be something like there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Oingo Boingo or... reference. I mean, there's not too much Oingo Boingo referencing. You can always have more of that. But <laughs> also, uh, the things aren't always as they seem. And that if you kind of get uh, things get blown out of proportion, you act out of control, then, you know, you get way far away from what was actually happening. I was actually wanting to know more about the contortionist who is credited as a swamp monster. That's um, Twisto. 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 And he grabs uh, Gil by the... 
cojones in one scene in the movie, but what what is Twisto's backstory? He just disappeared. He just disappeared. What was it that, uh, you know, the doctor was doing to help him? This was not made clear. So there's a lot of not just like misdirection with lots of little comedic bits, but lots of unexplained stuff that I found myself focusing on. Right. Uh, so, well, let's get into the movie and maybe talking it through will help us out. Maybe. This out. Maybe. So, our cold open, loving cold opens every time, is a bit of found footage of uh, these two guys in a forest. So, uh, they weren't credited with names, were they? No. No. So, the first guy is recording his, I'm assuming, friend in front of a mausoleum in the middle of the woods, you know, like most mausoleums are. And <laughs> already I could just not understand a word they were saying. Come on, Jim. You've been taking pictures of buildings all during our trip. Take a shot of me. Uh, I'm 90% sure they were speaking English. I honestly don't remember. No, but um. anyway, the... Guy in front of the mausoleum gets grabbed through the door. It's not like the door opens and someone grabs him, arms straight through the wood. And uh, we don't get to see the monster really, but the camera is dropped in a... It's a pretty choppy way to make the camera land perfectly. <laughs> uh, editing in this movie, not awesome. Uh, the two guys run away and uh, we just get to see like Frankenstein's feet and calves. And Look! It's Frankenstein! Right, and those weren't monster bit calves. Nope. Um, so, yeah, we know it's a video. There's a pullout and a fade to the scene where we're introduced to our main characters, Jack and Gil. And then Jack is played by the fantastic Jeff Goldblum. And Gil is played by Ed Begley Jr. In the thick of the time of his appeal as a movie star, which is a topic for a different day. I honestly, I've never heard of him before this movie. What was that? You've seen lots of 80s movies? Well, 80s horror movies. Uh, oh, he wasn't a horror guy, was oh, he? That's what oh, I thought. we're being much more specific now. Yeah. Okay. So Jeff Goldblum definitely carried this movie, but he did not save it. I'd say this is probably one of his worst roles. This is crap. I believe in real life this is where he met Gina Davis and they had their uh, real life relationship, which, you know ended as a lot of Hollywood romances do. I really would have liked to have seen the children that those two made. But anyway, um, Jack and Gil are reporters. Jack is much more classy, well-educated and experienced. He wants to use his time at this sort of tabloidish paper uh, to go on to bigger and better things. Gil, however, on the other hand, is a mudslinger. He can pay people to manufacture a story. And their editor, who is played by the delightfully mustachioed Mr. Roper, a.k.a. Norman Fell, has paired them up with the task of chasing down the origin of the found footage and getting a cover story for their tabloid paper. Definitely tabloid. I saw that we both noted the newspaper hanging from the wall uh, in the background with the title, Are Alien Creatures Using Your Body for Sex While You Sleep? Um... <laughs> Why was that particular one framed? It just, yeah, it was really prominent in the background. I'm not sure. I was feeling like there was some sort of subliminal messaging that was going on with that. But anyway. Maybe the movie should have been about that instead. Mm-hmm. That'd be funny. That's true. We could get more Jeff Goldblum, but like in the fly. Um. Oh, that's a that's a that's definitely another topic for a different day. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh. So, yeah, Gil is, Gil is actually the son of the uh, editor. Yeah, and um, I remember the one thing when... Because, like, Gil doesn't want to do it. Gil doesn't want to do the story. And he tells the editor, he's like, but I'm your son. And the guy says... Prove it. Prove it. <laughs> nice. Ha 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 ha. Ta ha ha. So, uh, the beginning, the setup, is actually the most interesting part of the movie. Uh, we both think. And it kind of falls off a cliff of absolute chaos and absurdity after this point. Yay. Yeah. So the pair, and we're probably not going to go into too much detail because it would require recounting stuff that we kind of zoned out on, but essentially the pair travel to Transylvania, where as far as I can tell, there are no actual Transylvanians. Yeah. Just Jeffrey Jones doing his best German Transylvanian accent. Welcome to Transylvania. That's the, that's the pedophile, right? Oh, the, in real life. Yes. Um, Michael Richards, uh, Carol Kane, and others 
and they're doing their gigs, jokes, slapstick bits. Um, the movie was filmed in Yugoslavia, mm. and a lot of the local community was cast as extras in the film. So not Transylvanians, but Yugoslavians. As it turns out, the $3 million movie budget was covered by Dow Chemical. This is apparently because it had invested in accumulated funds in Yugoslavian currency, but was prohibited by law from taking those funds. So it invested them in this movie, (laughs) filmed in Yugoslavia, which is east of Romania, a portion of which was historically identified as Transylvania. This movie had a $3 million budget. For uh, a movie made in the early 80s. And and I'll, we'll get to uh, whether or not it was a box office success or flop um, toward the end. Whoa, I feel like they could have done... Now that I know that their budget was pretty big, they could have done so much better. Well, Come how on. much did they pay each of those very famous ensemble cast members? That's the other thing. Yeah, I would be true. willing to wager that a good portion of their budget went to salary. Well, like, for special effects and stuff? There were no... I mean, the wolf boy was probably... The wolf boy, I'm, I'm assuming was, that person didn't actually have... No, but the, and that's probably one of the least difficult makeups to do, right? You just spirit gum a bunch of hair and, and you know, hairspray it in place. Right. Uh, so, yeah, definitely probably no need to do a detailed overview of the plot from here. Just a lot of uh, extra time on unnecessary and overlong comedy bits... Uh, basically, Jack and Gil uncover the fact that these, uh, quote, monsters are not monsters after all, uh, but townspeople who, due to one unfortunate circumstance or another, were shunned, exiled, you know, uh, Jekyll and Hyde inspired Dr. Malavakwa is only trying to help them through reconstructive or plastic surgery, and we don't get everyone's backstory, but the townspeople seem convinced, synthetic sufficiently to lay down their torches and pitchforks after they do the wait a minute this is this and then the people are like but but explain this and he's like yeah okay this happened logic yeah yeah so this is one of those examples of a movie instead of through clever plot devices wrapping up the story uses narration um so at the end of it, though, because everybody's friends and buddies and they get to hang out with these individuals who look like these monsters, Jack and Gil get tons of material to use for their paper back home. And apparently everyone lives happily ever after, including the makers of the movie. So like I said, um, was it a box office success or flop? Yeah. This movie actually made over $7 million in box office sales in North America. Oh, just North America. So U.S. and Canada. Nice. I'm not sure where else it might have been released. But that means it made back its $3 million budget plus some. Hmm. Now, the ad campaign at the time had suggested comparisons to Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein, and I bet Mm. that's why it did so well. Uh, That's, you know, definitely uh, false advertising. I didn't see this one in the theaters when it came out, but can you imagine being excited for another smart and funny monster movie spoof and then getting this? I only ever asked for a refund at the movies once in my life. But I probably would have done that for this one, too. What was the refund you asked for? Highlander 2. Ah, nice. Did you get it? (laughs) I did. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, it's really interesting that this was financed by Dow Chemical, I I think. uh, And we could link that to Darrow Chemical, so the creators of Trioxin and the basis of The Return of the Living Dead for our next episode. Definitely one of my favorite zombie movies, and I'm not super into zombie movies in the first place, but that's one I could actually sit through and laugh at. Yeah, we could do that. I think that movie is many times more entertaining than this one. I agree. Uh, We could also pick a minor character link to another Mel Brooks film, Madame... uh, How do you pronounce her name? Morovia? Morovia. Is that right? I don't know. Uh, Her husband, the wolfman's... wolf boy's dad was played by Rudy DeLuca, the writer and director of this movie, and the same actor who portrayed the killer in High Anxiety. And the character's name, I noted, is Lawrence Malbut, uh, which was direct and pretty lazy reference to Lawrence Talbot, who's the original Wolfman. Did did the lady know that her husband was... She knew something was up. <laughs> she, was trying to, she was trying to get them to catch him in the act, which they did, but... Apparently, Rudy DeLuca also wrote Dracula Dead and Loving It, starring Leslie Nielsen. We're not going to talk about that movie. Okay. Please don't. All right. Well, I think in some we can agree this movie, I don't know if it really tried, but it 
it was there. Uh, yeah. But the shticks were just too much. There's one part that we both agree is just ugh, overwrought. It's the scene where Malavaqua is the Jekyll Hyde uh, character, and every time he steps out of the lab, he becomes normal. And then inside the lab, he's a crazy scientist. And then he steps back out, and he's normal again. He steps back in, he's crazy. It's just too long. R- Radu, are you okay? You son of a bitch, I'll kill you! I was almost asleep by the end of that bit. Yeah. I, I won't even lie. <laughs> no, me too. Ah. And, uh, crap. The housekeeper, the the hunchback and his wife. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I think that those were good characters. Uh, I think, yeah, th- there were lots of ideas. So they could have had, like, maybe a little family. Because they did have, a, you know, could have been focused on their family. Right. Uh, the family of um, hunchbacks on purpose, right? And then right. at the end, they all stand up straight and... Yay, the little boy won't be mocked and whatever. But at the, at the same time, the wife chasing the husband around the kitchen always, like, it just got old. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. All right. It, it really did. I liked her. She was missing a few beans from the burrito. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I agree. They're just, they're pulling it out with too much. And we're going to talk about the butler, the, bu- the bus boy. What was his name? What? Who's the dude that always was, like, making jokes? Oh. Uh, it's like... Does it start with an F? I don't even remember. I think it's I like have it written down. Fa- Fringy or Foji or... I- uh, it is... Le- Fejos. Okay. Fejos. So, um, yeah, that... Uh, I'd say he was my favorite character in this movie. He's good, then. He was bizarre. Like, his sense of humor was just out there. He was weird, and he was making bizarre jokes and doing weird comedy bits that you weren't expecting, like having a fake hand and a fake leg and, and shutting them in the door. And then in the door, and he's screaming bloody murder, and then Gil's like, oh, my bad, and it's just fake. <laughs> yeah, that was a little... And do you mer- So Carol Kane, the woman who played Loopy that we were just talking about, right. so she she's the same character pretty much in everything that she does. Do you remember Princess Bride? I do. You remember her character yeah, from she's Princess like the Bride? Wife, yep, the right? wife of the Billy Crystal's uh, guy who reanimates Farm Boy. Anyway, yeah. So, would you would you say this movie movie <laughs> movie was it worth your time? Um, you I'll be honest. I would never have watched this movie if it hadn't been on our list, and I'm happy that we're able to work together and and do this. But um, not a great movie. Mm, yep. Yeah. I I really agree with that. Uh, it would have been, uh, I I really thought it would have been better, uh, especially with you know Jeff Goldblum leading the thing. Uh, but you know if you're just looking for something to play in the background or whatever, I'd say you could definitely do a lot worse than this. Womp, 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 womp. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Oh, yeah. all right. Well, that was fun. Yeah, it was. Uh, thanks for joining us for our first ever Critical episode. Uh, it really means a lot that you listened in. I'm Sylvia. I'm Robin. See you on the flip side, folks. Yay!